order. I'm absolutely thrilled, absolutely thrilled that Jamyang Norbu has joined me from his home in New York. Now, for everybody who's watching, Jamyang Norbu is a very interesting person. Uh, I was in college when I wrote his wonderful book, The Mandala of Sherlock Holmes, which imagined what Sherlock Holmes did in the quote-unquote missing years. I loved the book. I remembered him from that time. Since then, Jamyang Norbo has established himself as one of the preeminent researchers, writers, and historians studying the Tibetan cause. He's written, as we say in, uh, you know, among people who write history, he's written a doorstopper, as it were, of a book. Uh, you know, an incredible book, Echoes from the Forgotten Mountains, Tibet in War and Peace. Many people who follow the work of Global Order in more than 120 countries know that the Tibetan cause is something that we do a lot of work in. And the moment I got this incredible book, I immediately reached out to Jamyang Norbu, asking him if he would have a conversation with me. And he kindly agreed. Jamyang, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. This is an incredible book. This is truly an incredible book which tells the story of Tibetan resistance to the invasion they faced. In many minds in India, even today, the Tibetan story is imagined as in almost like the Chinese army swept Tibet, His Holiness left uh, you know, his palace and came away to Dharamshala. That's the sum total of the story. This book tells us definitively that there is so much more to that incredible history. I want to begin, Jamyang Norbu, from that question. Why is it? Why is it that more Indians have not traditionally explored, researched, and written extensively about the Tibetan cause? Why do you think that's true? Well, I think... Uh... To some extent, when the let's say when the Dalai Lama left Tibet, when the fighting started inside in the fifties, sixties, seventies, this was a uh, India that, um, especially among the leadership, was largely anti-colonial. They saw, in some ways, repressive governments only as the governments of white people. You know that the victims were always Asians or Africans, as the case may be. And so there was a kind of tendency in the Indian leaderships, beginning with Nehru, and also in the Indian media, which you know took its cue from uh, Fleet Street and uh, Times Square. You know, I mean, you know, in India in those days, even Time Magazine and Life were very cheap. You know, I mean, when I was young, I remember that's I used to read those magazines, and uh, all the you know, international kind of. Uh, let's say, you know, opinion pieces and all that came out even in Indian newspapers. A lot of it was reprints from the Western newspapers. So you, what you got really was, um, even among the Indian leadership, was uh, a very kind of Western orient, but Western left oriented. So there was uh, always a kind of, um, in you know, especially with uh, Nehru and company, there was a tendency to overlook what China, you know, what the, you know, even the Soviet Union and China, uh, their wrongdoing. So, like uh, things like, um, you know, it, you know, uh, Stalin's invasion of Hungary, you know, or e even all these sort of uh, uh, incidents were forgotten. And what was more important in India was what was going on in South Africa, you know, which, I, you know, of course, I. I'm saying it is a terrible thing, but Indians tended to concentrate more, mostly in what was happening in South Africa, all the wrongs that were being perpetuated there. Also, Palestine was the big issue with Indian intellectuals. But, you know, you had something far worse actually going on behind the Himalayas, you know, at your back door, and Indians completely overlooked it. And because it was a uh, kind of uh, trend at that time, and also there was it was the period of the new left, the left in those days, especially the kind of new Maoist, especially after the Cultural Revolution, it was a, you know, it was a big thing in India. You know, with the Naxalites, they took their cue from the, from the Maoists. So, and it was not only in India; it was a lot of things. You know, it was all over the world. So we got very little sympathetic press, even from uh, not only from India but even in the West, especially in Britain. 
you know, where you know, even, uh, let's say, like big newspapers like The Guardian in those days was basically a kind of a, a leftist, you know, Maoist tract. So, you know, in some ways, of course, I can understand why the Indians at that time, especially the intelligence here, didn't pick up on Tibet. And, uh, you know, I think it is it is a real pity because so much of Tibetan culture represents something that is really, I think, important and wonderful for Indians. It, you don't have to make up certain mythological ideas. It is there at your back. The Tibetans took Indian, uh, let's say, Buddhism, you know, and the, in the second half of the Buddhist kind of development in India, the Mahayana, the Tantrayana, you know, which you don't have in many other places in the world. And they developed it with all, you know, uh, respect towards India. And the Tibetans, even now, when we talk of any kind of text, uh, we always say, you know, how do we say this text is authentic? And they always say this in the language of the noble country, you know, of Arya, Arya Desa. When you say that, it means it's from India, and that means it's authentic. What you have from local writers is not considered authentic. So the India is always respected. And uh, for Indians, it would have been, I think, wonderful if uh, they had managed to sort of concentrate on, not only on the cultural aspects of Tibet, but politically what is happening. So that was neglected. Uh, of course, there were exceptions, I think, uh, especially among the Indian leadership at the time. You know, people, uh, uh, let's say leaders like Acharya Kripalani, Jay Prakash Narayan, you know, and of course, um, Sardar Patel was one of the, uh, you know, early sort of uh, Indian leaders who warned Nehru about what was happening in Tibet and was ignored. So I think uh, there were sort of reasons, these were the sort of reasons why the Indians for a long time, you know, uh, really didn't, uh, uh, let's say, um, show any great interest in Tibet. Uh, but and but and also because after the Dalai Lama came, to a great extent it was our fault also. The Tibetans really didn't uh, push their uh, history, you know, their cause and their issues, you know, widely in the Indian world. Did all the uh, what India saw was the Dalai Lama, Buddhism, you know, monasteries, temples, and the religious issues. And of course his holiness, even after he got the Nobel Peace Prize, it was largely given for, uh, let's say, nonviolent uh, activism, you know, his kind of dedication to peace. But uh, unfortunately, the reality is that the whole Tibetan issue is about fighting. It's about war. You know, there was no nonviolent, uh, let's say, activist, activism inside Tibet at all. This is all... Uh, after we had come to India, after we had, had come to exile in India, we picked it up from uh, Gandhian ideas that we absorbed later on. Earlier in Tibet, it was all fighting. It was fighting all the way, just from the beginning of the Chinese invasion in 1950, communist invasion in 1950, and even earlier, because there was the Republic of China, with which we had wars, and even with Manchu China, which we had been fighting. Till uh, let's say the last of the fighting in Tibet ended only in let's say in the late seventies and eighties, you know. So for decades, Tibetans had been carrying on this war. So this is uh, the history that I I have tried to present. And this is the this is the incredible history uh, that your book talks about. It goes from forgotten mountains, Tibetan war and peace. I want to come to that point you just mentioned, Jamyang, about Sardar Patel. As somebody who's a biographer of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, I want oh. to, uh, you're of course, you know, talking about uh, the famous letters he wrote to Pandit yeah. Nehru uh, yeah. and, and to Girija Shankar Bajpai, pointing out that Chinese imperialism indeed, in fact, exactly what you said, was in fact as dangerous as the Western imperialism that they were fighting and that Chinese imperialism in time, in time, would prove to be far more dangerous for India as it had already proved before Patel's death in Tibet, far more dangerous for India than Western imperialism. Talk to us a little bit about why that warning was ignored. At the end of the day, uh, India welcomed His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he fled. But the message that you talk about, the message yes. that the, 
threatened causes about resistance was forgotten? No, I think primarily, like, you know, it was uh, Nehru's kind of, uh, let's say, international diplomatic, uh, his ambitions, you know, and I am not in some ways just uh, being anti-left here, you know. I mean, I can understand his point of view. He, he came, his sort of, uh, the opposition he faced was from the British Empire. They were anti-imperialists and good for them, you know, anti-colonialists. I can completely understand and sympathize with that. But uh, at the same time, I think it it blinded him, you know, it, it put blinkers on his vision, you know. He didn't see anything beyond that. But, uh, you know, and in some ways, he had the idea of Tibet uh, from Chinese propaganda, that this was something, Tibet had in some ways been ripped away from the Chinese empire by the British and given this kind of pseudo independent status by the British. And uh, he felt maybe, you know, the Chinese were right, you know, and uh, Nehru, I, in many ways, like even his kind of Buddhism, he was a kind of a closet Buddhist, you know, in some ways, if, you know, if you've been to his, uh, you know, the Tin Murti, where, you know, I visited once a long time ago, and all you see are little statues of Buddha all in mantelpieces and just next to his bedroom, you know, doors and things. But he, he took all his Buddhist ideas from Western Buddhists, you know, uh, early uh, English and colonial kind of, uh, let's say, architects and, and scholars and of Buddhism and stuff, and their writings, and their their writings are, you know, in some ways, these are uh, this is a kind of interpretation of Buddhism, which at that time I think was valid. But if now we know that actually these are what we call Protestant Buddhists, Buddhists who are, I mean, who are taking more kind of Western kind of uh, Christian ideas and inserting them into Buddhism. And Nehru had a very kind of uh, strange kind of, um, let's say, viewpoint of Tibet. You know, he regarded even like Kushok Bakula that, you know, you've written about. When Bakula was made a member of parliament, and he was a Congress member of parliament, and Nehru really tried hard to get him to give up his Tibetan monastic robe. Because that was, Nehru saw this as, a, you know, one of the kind of more debased Buddhism across the Himalayas. You know, he, and he wanted a more kind of... Um, Theravada type, what they regarded it at that time as a purer form of early Buddhism. And he wanted Kushal Bakula to wear a Theravada robe. And Bakula, of course, refused. You know, he, he's a traditionalist. So, there, you know, even within these small things, there was a kind of idea that maybe Tibetan Buddhism, you know, was, you know, they, they were taking Western cues about Tibetan Buddhism. That tantric Buddhism is basically Buddhism made up of, you know, Tibetan sort of. Uh, shamanistic beliefs mixed with a purer form of Buddhism that the Tibetans completely ruined, you know. They didn't, nobody knew that actually Tantric Buddhism came from Nalanda, you know, that it was imported into Tibet, you know, and it was not something the Tibetans made up. So for all these many reasons, I think, you know, and I, we can go into a lot of details, Nehru had very strange ideas about Tibet, but I don't think in any way it was malignant, you know, or malicious. So, you know, but there was that. And the problem really, it started when, just before the Tibetan invasion, when the Tibetans had appealed to the United Nations. And the British, uh, you know, got the Indians also not to support the Tibetans in the United Nations. And this is something where, you know, in uh, where even we have uh, the British, the last British representative to Tibet was uh, a great scholar, Hugh Richardson. And he came out clearly, he said in Britain that the British government sold the Tibetans down the river. And for saying that, he, you know, the, the British government was very spiteful. They really, after that, he was denied any honors, you know, except his basic pension. They didn't give him, a, you know, usually they get a knighthood or something, after, something like that. Especially he was considered the greatest Tibetan uh, scholar of his time. So, and then Nehru... And the you know, Indians and the, let's say, the British, and especially since the British had a veto, you know, in the United Nations, they stopped, uh, basically they vetoed the General Assembly discussion that was going to be held just on the, you know, point when Tibet was being invaded. And that was, at that time, things could have changed, but um, unfortunately, you know, it didn't. And Tibetans believe, and of course we have no evidence to prove this, 
that uh, the British did this in some ways. They had made a secret deal with the Chinese to save Hong Kong. Because, you know, the, you know, when the communists came to power in 49 in China, they had this great kind of uh, fervor to liberate China of all foreign imperialist, uh, let's say, uh, you know, um, whatever they had done badly before. So they were going to liberate Taiwan, they were going to liberate Tibet. And Hong Kong was also in the, it, and of course it should be, because it was clearly, this was something that uh, colonial China, I mean, China and uh, Imperial China had to give up to the British Empire, uh, Empire and other sort of Western uh, Imperial countries. So this is unfortunately Nehru and the British, you know, side by side, they sort of gave up Tibet. And from then on, of course, things went from bad to worse, you know. Talk a little bit about the history that your terrific history, this incredible history that you're painting, which has been forgotten. This, in a sense, when I read your book, is a history of resistance. Absolutely, yeah. Tell us a little bit about this resistance. There are so many things that Indians are discovering even today about Tibetan warriors who fought battles uh, against Mao's army. Uh, about warriors who stalled Mao's army, about many other facets of Tibetan resistance that are never understood or never have been properly understood in India. Think us through some of the main highlights according to you. No, I think one of the real problems, um, uh, you know, for not only for Indians but you know even you know all over the world is they only see Tibet as a kind of a Buddhist uh, Shangri La. And that has been prevalent for, you know, for decades, you know, ever since James Hilton's great book, you know, The, the Lost Horizon. But you know, people tend to forget, you know, why you actually have a complete, a Tibet was principally because it was a military empire. You know, all the tribes and uh, small kingdoms of the whole Tibetan plateau were united, you know, in the 6th and 7th century by the Tibetan emperor Songtsen Gampo. All the way from you know, from Baltistan, you know, north of Baltistan, all the way to inside China, even now into Kansu, a number of these Chinese sort of uh, provinces, these were all part of the Tibetan Empire that very successfully contested the Chinese Tang Dynasty, and managed to hang on till about you know around the eleventh and twelfth century, and this was very powerful. Like even like. At one point, you know, when the Emperor Harsha had been deposed in India, I mean, the, the Tibetans sent troops, their kind of uh, cavalry from Nepal to reinstall him because he was a Buddhist king by Songtsen Gapo. Nepal was a protect, protectorate state of Tibet. The Tibetan, even cavalry seemed to have, one historian said, actually gotten to the Bay of Bengal, where they sort of renamed it, you know, the Bay of Tibet or whatever. But, you know, we're not too sure, but then they were true. But, the, you know, the thing is, the whole uh, Tibetans, why they stick so, why they resist, resisted China? Why they, uh, you know, in, kept up the fight so long, all in spite of all the difficulties and the sacrifices to made? Because they have this memory of belonging to this great empire, you know. It's not just Buddhism. If it was Buddhism, they wouldn't be fighting, you know, they'd be you know, uh, holding out their hands in peace. But it is this memory of being part of a great empire that Tibetans carry with them. And, you know, this it is this empire that created the Tibetan, uh, let's say, uh, the language, the spoken Tibetan that we, uh, all Tibetans share. All You know, even in Baltistan now, in Pakistan, they have this community that are still trying to write Tibetan and speak Tibetan. And mullahs don't allow them to write in Tibetan because they have to write in Urdu. You know, but they are of course Muslims, but they carry this uh, racial memory with them. So this is you know right inside China, and you know you have this, and that is what provides Tibetans with that incentive, a basic kind of incentive. It's not only fighting against injustice and oppression, but also you know with this idea that once our ancestors actually competed. In, in High Asia, in Central Asia, against the Chinese Empire, you know, which gives the Tibetans this kind of pride and this, uh, let's say, a kind of certain martial kind of, uh, let's say, memory of their, uh, you know, of their ancient world. 
So this is, I think, one of the most important things that Tibetans have. And also, like, uh, be, you know, before the communists invaded also, Tibetans have had invasions from the Republic of China, you know, after it came into existence. We were fighting wars with them in the eastern Tibet. We are fighting wars with the Manchu Empire. So it has been ongoing, you know, and of course, over time, the Tibetan population was much stronger and we tended to lose a lot of these wars. But nonetheless, we were effective in actually keeping out the Chinese from, uh, let's say, from Tibetan areas, especially in eastern Tibet and northeastern Tibet. Now, one of the things that I think the British sort of saw in Tibet was that it could be used as a buffer state because the Tibetans were intent on keeping China out of Tibet. They weren't really worried about the border of India. It was keeping China out of Tibet. And the British used that. So it, they encouraged Tibetans to a certain extent to uh, fight for their independence. But they also did not want to annoy the Chinese because they had great business relations in Shanghai. You know, they didn't want to jeopardize that. So what they did was... Uh, they limited the Tibetan kind of um, push for independence by talking about suzerainty. The Tibetan was independent, but they were suzerain to uh, the Chinese Empire. So, with this qualification, you know, it served British in you know in both ways. It sort of um, helped to provide a buffer state against China, and at the same time, it you know it prevented. Uh, the Chinese from actually getting angry with the British and maybe uh, harming their business interests in Shanghai, you know, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit, and we'll talk about all those geopolitical aspects and geostrategic aspects, but let me take you back to the history in your book. Talk to us a little bit about the resistance that Mao's army faced inside Tibet. Some of the epic battles that we should know uh, as mm -hmm. Indians across the world, uh, which really are not known at all. No, okay. First thing I think we, what must be acknowledged is that even when the initial kind of, uh, let's say, the Chinese invasion took place in 1950, you know, earlier Chinese armies had uh, entered Tibet, uh, northeastern Tibet, in a place called Amdo, which is uh, what they now call Qinghai and Kansu. And Tibetans had been fighting there also. It is fairly, you know, the the kind of documentation we have is very recent, but we know that there was great fighting there. But when they entered Tibet proper, let's say, you know, under the Lhasa government in Chamdo in, uh, you know, October 1950, the Tibetans did resist. You know, they, they did put up a resistance, uh, quite effective. For some time, you know, historians in the West, especially in the United States, fairly lefty historians had been coming out and basically saying, and even in Britain, that the once the People's Liberation Army came, marched into Tibet, the Tibetans basically ran away. The Chinese exploded a few, fired a few shots and Tibetans ran away. And that is, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's the biggest lie that these people spread. It came out even in the Guardian articles like that. The Chinese just threw a few firecrackers and the Tibetans ran away. And that's a complete lie, as you know, like uh, I've devoted about three chapters in my book to explaining what actually had happened. And these days we have more information coming, even from Chinese sources, which have been opened up. And there are some scholars who have managed to gain access to them and who've helped me to uh, help giving me some kind of information from their sources. And we know actually Tibetans put up a tremendous resistance considering the size of their army. The Chinese had actually one whole, the 18th army, three divisions, each division like 20,000, uh, let's say, troops. So we had, they had about 60,000 troops invading Chamdo. Tibetans had about only about uh, 6,000, you know, uh, soldiers in Chamdo guarding it. Nonetheless, these people managed to fight off the Chinese for some time and even conducted, although the, the main commander, uh, Ngapo, had surrendered, many of the other uh, regiments there didn't surrender and conducted an uh, let's say an effective fighting retreat all the way you know back um, about 170 miles from Lhasa and there they set up a defense perimeter which they held on to for another year 
which, you know, and, and that gave the Tibetan government an opportunity to approach the United Nations because they're holding the Chinese back. So then they sent their delegation to the United Nations and made all these appeals back and forth, you know, and it took time. But finally, you know, we lost our case in the United Nations. Although like few countries in the West, like even El Salvador took up, you know, they sponsored the Tibetan issue. But then the British and the Indians didn't uh, do anything. And the Americans sort of were waffled at that time, which was unfortunate. So th that was the initial fighting. After the Tibetans had to surrender after, you know, one year after the Chinese invaded, gradually there was discontent spreading all over Eastern Tibet. You know, because the Chinese started what they called their um, democratic reforms, which is basically land reform, but quite very violent. Landlords and all was, uh, you know, struggled, beaten, people were killed. Um, it was Mao's initial, and it was done not only in Tibet, but all over China. But the Tibetans reacted to this uh, by uh, rising up against the Chinese starting in 1956. So there it was very violent. It was Tibetans, and one of the first programs that the Chinese had in Tibet was before they conducted land reforms was to get Tibetans to surrender their weapons. You know, and these are all tribal areas, whole of Eastern Tibet, there's tribal areas. These people had, everyone had to have a gun. You know, it was like Afghanistan in a way. It, it was a point of pride that every family had a rifle and, you know, not much ammunition, maybe a couple of hundred rounds. But uh, they used that and the first fighting started in 56. And that is when uh, the CIA actual interest in Tibet came because then they realized that it was very big. It was in many, many tribes all over eastern Tibet that this took place. And monastery, then the Chinese used fighter uh, bombers, fighters, and then we had this the European, you know, who defended the great, one of the biggest monasteries in eastern Tibet, Lithang Monastery, and, you know, he died there. And so this is where I bring in a whole host of other people, you know, even women who were fighting at that time, who led their men, you know, tribal chieftains and things. And so we have this whole account. But then once the Chinese brought in more and more reinforcement and then squashed all these uprisings, many of these refugees from these areas, they fled to central Tibet, to Lhasa. Now, of course, Lhasa, the Chinese were there already. But for the Tibetans, like Dalai Lama, in some ways, is like a kind of a focus for their kind of faith and their you know national identity. So these people went to Lhasa. And the Chinese were in Lhasa, they couldn't immediately react because at that time they, they were really, uh, you know, in, at a point where they're trying to convince the Tibetan government that they had come with peaceful intentions. Uh, they were trying to get the Dalai Lama to accept uh, the Tibet autonomous region. They had taken them down to China, you know, for the first, I think, the Chinese you know, National Congress. Where he was made a kind of a deputy, uh, deputy chairman, or I think you know, he had a big position. And this is where, in some ways, the Tibetans, we were completely fooled by them. And, and I'm not saying this as an insult. Every country in the world, every leader in the world who went to China has received this treatment. There are actually books by scholars on this. They were very good at it. It's not only like, uh, you know, Nixon and Kissinger and, you know, and the president, uh, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau. Every Western leader who went there, leader from the third world even, and intellectuals, Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, you know, and, and, you know, uh, and, and all the great American writers. And, you know, they remember the ambassador to India, Galbraith, you know, uh, uh, Kennedy's he was thrilled. He was enthralled with China. He thought it was such a wonderful uh, country and everything was going hunky-dory. Actually, he was there during the height of the Chinese famine. When all over China, people were starving to death, but they gave him, they put a chef in charge, you know, of his meals in the trains, wherever he went, he was getting the best meal. And he talks about it in his book. You know, and he is the kind of the liberal uh, sort of... Uh, uh, sort of great liberal economist for Americans. It's completely fooled by the, and it's not, you know, there are many, many, I won't go into details now, but so when all of this was happening inside Tibet, 
it was only actually the CIA and the program that the CIA actually had with Tibet was initially very small. And fortunately for us, some of the officers that the CIA used were uh, far more sort of military men. They were not really part of that whole kind of uh, secret world. And they really were very loyal to the Tibetan world, although there were many efforts to try to stop the uh, Tibetan program. You know, especially after the uh, you know the disaster that happened in the Bay of Pigs and you know in Cuba, the CIA kept on their support for Tibetans in a long time, and that is when in Lhasa, you know, in fifty six seven, Tibetan traders, Tibetan merchants from Eastern Tibet, from Kham, you know, who heard what was happening in their homeland back in Eastern Tibet, mm -hmm. then they started the Four Rivers Six Ranges, the Chushi Kangduk. And that started, again, a, a second wave of resistance to the Chinese. And that is when you had the great kind of, uh, that's, you know, the, the ride north, you know, the epic kind of ride of Gompotashi going north and fighting. Tell us a little all. bit about that. Tell us a little bit about that epic ride, because that is a fascinating thing that I don't think a lot of people know. Yeah, it, and the thing was, uh, it wasn't intended to go like that. Initially, they were waiting for American supply to come to, you know, where they had the base in a place called Chigutang. So, but the problem was the Americans were waffling. They wanted more information. They wanted to know actually what the Tibetan uh, resistance was capable of. So we had to send people to India to try to convince the, you know, the CIA. And then Gopotashi felt that, you know, the Americans were not really serious about this. And he had to get, uh, you know, weapons. And they knew, and the you know Tibetan government, senior Tibetan government official, had told them that they had a cache of secret cache of weapons hidden in Western Tibet, and they had to go after that. So Gompotashi took a large section of his men, I think nearly about a thousand people, on horse. These are all mounted people, and they went to this place and they managed to get these weapons. But then the problem was the Chinese had also by that time known what was happening, and they sent you know their sort of soldiers, the PLA after them. So these people had to keep on retreating north and they keep, kept fighting and retreating and fighting and retreating all the way northeast until they went through this, what we call the Changdang, which is the whole northern stretch of Tibet, which is really one of the coldest, most semi-desert-like um, places you know that you have in the world. It's, it's not even steppe country. Steppe country, you have... Uh, you know, a certain amount of grass and pasture land. There, the, even the pasture land is limited. So they were fighting all this way, starting with about 1,000 people and ending up actually like where they finally reached maybe just about 150 people were left. Kopotashu had been wounded. He had about uh, a dozen or shrapnel inside his body. And he was an old man, actually. And he, these were not people who had actually been soldiers before that. They were all merchants, you know, and uh, monks and, you know, what have you. None of them were. But I think, they, you know, in, in the end, um, they killed a lot of Chinese on the way there. And uh, they made a name for themselves because they had one or two of their people, you know, like when they were scattered after a fight, some of them managed to reach Lhasa. And when they got to Lhasa, they managed to contact the Tibetan army. Uh, and talk to them about what happened. So some of these army and some of the Tibetan policemen there, they set up committees and they they wrote down everything that had happened. And they they made posters about this just to inform the Tibetan public in central Tibet and stuck it up all over the place. And it inspired a lot of people to to realize that, you know, even after the Tibetan official Tibetan army had surrendered, these people were really fighting all over and really destroying the Chinese, destroying their convoys. And by the time that time, the Chinese had built roads, they had big convoys coming in, and we were raiding these convoys. So it was just, you know, it was incredibly violent. But uh, all these accounts came across. And even when I was a kid in Darjeeling, I remember hearing, you know, about these things, you know. So yeah, it was uh, it was very big, and that was that all that fighting led eventually to the March tenth, you know, the uprising in Lhasa, where you had the the public basically uh, came out to defend the Dalai Lama, but then in some ways Tibetan officials had planned this. It was 
you know, the idea we get that this was a spontaneous thing and the Dalai Lama escaped. The Dalai Lama actually didn't want to leave. He was, he wanted to, you know, he believed that the program that he was conducting with the Chinese on what they call the, you know, Tibet Autonomous Region, the establishment of the Tibet Autonomous Region and the modernization of Tibet and blah, blah, and so on and so forth, that would work. But then he was put in a position Actually, not only by the public, but even by his own kind of senior sort of, uh, let's say, officials, that they sort of in some way coerced him into leaving Tibet. That's why the Chinese always say that he was kidnapped early on. This this was what the Chinese were accusing the Tibetans of, of kidnapping the Dalai Lama. Now, they're not, you know, of course, he wasn't kidnapped. But they, one could sort of say, you know, in a manner of speaking, that yes, there was a, a certain kind of coercion involved in getting the Dalai Lama to leave Tibet. You know? Because he did believe, actually, for a long time that, uh, you know, he if, even now he claims to be a Marxist Buddhist, you know. He still hasn't given up his faith in Marxism. Which, you know, I mean, for me, it's like, uh, I know he's an incredibly intelligent and learned person, and I respect him tremendously for it. And all I can say is, in some ways, the, Chi you know, the Chinese capacity for, let's say, brainwashing, for, you know, what you call indoctrination, is tremendous. You know, you take someone so intelligent, sensible, and he's still stuck to this, you know, after all these years. A little bit, let's cut to the present at the moment. Yeah. When you were talking to me about how, you know, Galbraith and others went to China, in the middle of a famine and were fooled to think that everything was wonderful in China. You know, I was immediately thinking about how today, you know, the UK is, is you know, there's, a, there's turmoil in the UK with news that uh, political parties at the highest levels of U British establishment have been infiltrated by Chinese spies. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and and in the U.S., you know, they worry about the same thing. You know, the Chinese technology and Chinese spies have infiltrated at the highest level. They worry about the same thing in Canada. Uh, tell us about what you think about the Chinese, current Chinese state's ability to convince people uh, about their reality. Because, you know, a lot of people are no longer fooled, as is evident from what's happening around the world. But there is still... You know, a, a lot of, you know, newspapers and so on and so forth, media organizations still tend to give the Chinese Communist Party a sort of easier hand, should I say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, even now, it, it's incredible. But the, the thing is, um, you know, they have this real sophistication because this is not something that they dreamed up, you know, let's say, you know, yesterday or, you know, even a decade earlier. It is traditional. In China, it has been that since the, you know, and there's actually studies and I've got you know, books on how they've, they conceived of this in a, in a sense to, uh, let's say, the strength that the Communist Party had during the civil war also against the Gomintang. They were weaker. They, they had to sort of just hang around the mountains, conduct sort of minor guerrilla warfare, while the Gomintang actually got the, the brunt of, you know, they fought the Japanese, but also they got all the American aid, aid that the Allies provided went to the Gomintang. Now, at that time, the Gomint, you know, the communists were really careful about their image. They knew that the kind of propaganda they came out with was not good enough. It wouldn't work on the Western mind. So they got Westerners. They got American uh, ex-communists, American leftists. And these people came because of the, let's say, the Spanish Civil War. Threw up a whole lot of these people who, who were disgusted with fascism. So they tended to come, uh, when they came to Asia, you know, communist agents you know, from the Comintern picked them up and took them to China, took them to, you know, let's say, Mao's caves at Yan'an. And there they found the ideal communist kind of uh, society, you know, where you know, everyone is dressed the same, Mao Zedong and all wearing the same kind of shabby suit as everyone else and eating the same. And uh, they, they were so enchanted by this. The books, so many books were written of that period where, you know, like, you know, even the more liberal, let's say, you know, uh, ruler like, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek, 
wasn't it not i'm not saying he's an absolute liberal but compared to the communists he was you know it, he had to be because of the kind of uh, government he had he was considered uh, let's say a fascist dictator while the communists were considered to be you know a really ideal kind of um, uh, sort of communist sort of uh, you know even let's say um, you know in harvard you had the you know at john king fairbanks it's just the great Harvard kind of dean of Harvard, uh, Chinese studies. He considered Mao to be uh, just an agrarian reformer, you know. And uh, you had all that going on. It, this fascination in the West, it increased, especially, I think, in America. Because America always had a kind of a more, a kind of a fascination for China. While India is, like, say, more important to the Brit, to the British, and they were, you know, India, they, they considered their kind of territory. Like China, it was very important to Americans because a lot of Americans, when they went to church, kids, when they collected pennies, they gave it to, you know, to help the Chinese Christians in uh, in the old days, you know, like um, so the, their pennies were collected at church. So there is that missionaries went, American missionaries went to China. And so many of these missionaries were disgusted at what the Gomintang were doing or even like with Western kind of uh, uh, colonial activities in uh, let's say in China, so they because communism was at a distance. You know the communists were really far away, so people tended to idealize them. You know, and this is and over time, you know the Chinese managed to really use this. Uh, even the great book on communist China, you know, Red Star over China, you know, uh, by that American journalist. You know, it it became bestseller. It still is in print, and everyone reads it. So th at that time, it's it was like uh, the American fascination with China is, you know, and then it, it spread all over the world. You know, the French were fascinated by it. You know, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, all these people. You know, in, in India, you even had like, you know, our Mr. Subramaniam Swami. He, he was taken to China at that time and he was thrilled. And this was, I think, in the 70s. Huh? And he came back and he said that... He's realized and he told Indians that, you know, Buddhism didn't go to Tibet from uh, India. It went actually around from China and had come all the way there. That's what the Chinese told him. <laughs> and he was just fascinated by what was going on there. You know, And this is everyone, everyone who's been, you know, been taken there. Had been, and the Chinese are very good at giving presents. They have no real compunction, you know, envelopes full of, you know, the currency notes and all. Just put it on the table beside you in the dining table, huh? You know, they really have, uh, there is no real uh, sort of compunction about trying to get you on their side. They do it very well. And the business opportunities, you know, this is the, where they will promise you anything, you know. So this is and, like... Uh, you know, even as you're talking about this, I'm thinking, of course, this is exactly what happened a few years, a few decades later. You know, China convinced the West that if the West pumped in money into China, it would become democratic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And rose on the back, you know, what, what Mao's army convinced those economists that, you know, this was an ideal society. You know, a few decades down the road, China explained to America and the West that, you know, if you invest huge amounts of money, uh, you know, into our economy, we will become this sort of, you know, new liberal, you know, uh, haven. And lo and behold, 30, 40 years down the line, it hasn't happened. The Chinese Communist Party's grip on the state is stronger than ever before. So it's almost like, you know, what you're, what you're explaining repeated itself in economic terms in the last 30, 40 years too. You know, when uh, the thing is, we have to realize that after the Cultural Revolution, you know, and uh, earlier the, the famines that were created by Mao's Great Leap Forward, all these programs, which was disastrous, you know, like, it's like unbelievable. I have, you know, I don't even know any country you know, now. Frank Dikuta's books have told us what the reality yeah. were, right? I mean, Frank Dikuta's trilogy yeah, yeah, on yeah. explaining exactly what happened there. You know, I was doing, I was in, uh, like, you know, in the Tibetan government kind of, uh, I was, a, let's say, a China specialist for them, you know. And for the French intelligence also. And right from that time, you know, it was information that we got coming out of China. It was incredible, the amount of self-inflicted disaster that was going on in China. So by the time, let's say, China had made up with America, you know, basically it had sort of um, 
it was at the end of its tether. There was no industry. It had all been destroyed. You know, there was no agriculture. Education, 10 years, there had been no universities that had been shut down because of the Cultural Revolution. You were looking at a country that had really been bled, you know, by the Communist Party. There was nothing really. And the Chinese were desperate now, you know. So when the... Remember at the time, there was uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Tanaka, first visit to China. And the... Uh, he was, and the actually the, uh, the Japanese parliament and even like uh, uh, the administration said we should apologize to China for the uh, invasion. And he in apologized to Chairman Mao. And Mao told him, no, no, please don't apologize. If you hadn't invaded us, we wouldn't be in power. <laughs> and basically what they wanted from the, the Japanese were investments. And they were rescued, I think, uh, in the nick of time, even by Nixon. You know, Americans got not, nothing out of their kind of rapprochement with China, you know, because they, the real hope that they had was that China would help them to get them out of Vietnam, you know, on the war. And the Chinese did nothing, you know. Of course, um, the Americans, you know, that with the Russians, basically the Chinese had all, already had uh, split up with the Russians. So that was, there was nothing they could do on that. But the American hope was on Vietnam, that the Vietnam War, they could end it earlier. And Nixon was really kind of desperate on that. But they got nothing out of China. The Chinese got all the investment, you know, all Western money, Western technology, you know. I mean, and there is a, essentially a kind of shamelessness about it, you know, from the Chinese point of view. They're taking everything. And, at, you know, and we are at a point in time when, uh, you know, they are claiming to be the greatest economy in the world. You know, but I don't think, uh, you know, in some ways that uh, that position is tenable, as we can see right now, you know. And let's talk a little bit about that, Jamyang. You know, Spasad, this propaganda empire that had been created, yeah. seems to be crumbling now. The West has finally woken up and all its dreams and ambitions about where China would go have not come true. Not only have they not come true, China using its you know, Western money, Western technology, as you just described, has become this belligerent force in the world, you know, threatening yeah, peace uh, you know, in its neighborhood, uh, threatening peace around the world, and of course, even challenging the incumbent hegemon, so to speak, the United States. Yeah, and yeah. therefore, all the sort of, you know, Calculations are now, uh, you know, changing. This month, for the first time, I was looking at numbers this month or last month. Um, for the first time in you know, decades, Mexico has exported more to the United States than China. But there, of course, also the economists have pointed out, it's a question of relabeling. China sends its goods to Mexico, which are then labeled Mexican and sold to the United States. But there is a real disenchantment, Jamyang, about China and the world today, a real sense of disenchantment. Their economy seems highly unstable. For years, we have known that their numbers, you know, we don't know what is the truth about their numbers. Talk to us a little bit about where you see all of this going and indeed what it means for the future of the Tibetan cause. No, I, you know, I've really been uh, sort of promoting the idea even within the Tibetan world. You know, and I don't have much of a voice, you know, especially these days. I've been marginalized for a number of decades on this. That Tibetans should really give up any idea of uh, having negotiation with China. It's always ended badly for us. They're very good at this. They, they can string you along, you know, they take you on a few banquets. And every potential diplomat in the Tibetan world, you know, is sort of just with his tongue out, you know, everyone's hoping and then there also is not only Tibet, it's like certain Western kind of so-called uh, you know, scholars in Tibet and, and you know, self-appointed diplomats who want to hang out with the Tibetans to be included in part of this. And it's nonsense. You know, like it, people who really don't understand China are saying, telling Tibetans that what they really have to do, even if it's not something that can be done immediately, is to commit yourself to a struggle for Tibetan independence. And even if you don't have a single bullet with you, you have to imply that this would mean even uh, you know, uh, militant resistance you know, against China. The thing is, the moment you have taken a stand like this and made that position, it puts the other side in a difficult position also. The, the way they react to this, 
you know, and within the Tibetan world, even inside Tibet, once that sort of, uh, let's say, uh, position has been taken by leaders in exile and by, um, you know, intellectuals in exile, inside the Tibetan world, the reaction would be very strong. You know, even without very much kind of, uh, let's say, nationalistic rhetoric from the exiled world, inside Tibet, we've had more than 160 people committing self-immolation. Now that is a world record, you know, and I'm I'm not being boastful about it. It is a terrible thing, you know. But these are people who are desperate. These are not people who want to commit, uh, let's say, self-immolation. But there is no other alternative. The Chinese kind of, you know, the, the Chinese security inside, internal security inside Tibet is tremendous. I mean, I've provided some statistics, you know, like the China has an enormous kind of, uh, let's say, uh, defense budget. But their in sec uh, budget for internal security is much larger. And the greatest kind of, uh, let's say, the, percent the percentage of that goes to Tibet, not even to Xinjiang, you know. Tibetans per, let's say, person, more money is spent on, uh, let's say, securing uh, an individual Tibetan security-wise than uh, Chinese or for even Xinjiang. So it is tremendous. And these people are living under that system. So one, you know, I am hopeful that if this carries on this way, but also if the Tibetans in exile manage to get there, act together and uh, manage to sort of provide some kind of real positive direction, you know, towards people inside Tibet, talk about a free Tibet, an independent Tibet, you know, to them, then I think we can expect movement across the Himalayas. You know. A little bit about, you know, you've been a long time China watcher. You know, we know that Chinese economic numbers are now very shaky. Unemployment numbers are also looking extremely grave. Um, you know, there's a water crisis in China. Uh, in, in many ways, people say in the future, there might be a food crisis in China. But according Populate. to you, Already, in many ways, cases there are a food crisis in China. Tell us, what, according to you, is the greatest Achilles heel of, of China today? It, it's nearly all these things. You know, and the thing is, uh, what we have to realize is even the kind of uh, the natural disasters that China is facing. Uh, these, these are not, like a lot of other countries, the, you know, what we have, this, they're facing sort of certain natural dis disasters and uh, problems because of climate change, you know, and which is also man-made. But in China, it's even earlier. It goes back to Mao's, let's say, you know, the Great Leap Forward. They really destroyed the Chinese countryside at that time to plant new crops. Trees were cut down. All ancient, even lakes were filled in to create more agricultural land. Wheat and rice, grain was the, let's say, was based, the basic kind of uh, index on which any kind of progress was counted, you know, by the Communist Party. It was very na narrow. You had enormous, enormous, and it happened in the Soviet Union also. And because of that, right now, so much of the natural disasters they're facing is compounded. And I think it's going to get worse every year. But uh, that, I think, is one of the real kind of frightening things that China could be facing. And it's not something like, let's say, you know, you have the, uh, let's say, the, the you know, the, the problem in China, like the, um, the housing bubble that they have. See, the government can manipulate that in many ways. In you know, like in the United States, of course, after a certain while, you have to let the market crash. You know, the governments just can't keep fooling around with that permanently. But in China, they can play with it for some time. So I'm not really hopeful from some real economic disaster. But I think the problem really now China is facing with uh, with no jobs for a lot of younger people. And the thing is, if they lose a lot of their production, if they lose their markets in the West and uh, younger people don't have, you know, the job, many of them have to return to the villages, you know, because, you know, the idea that, the, you know, you had a very modern, educated China, in some ways, it's totally exaggerated. You know, the, the Chinese have tremendously invested so much in their very big, you know, universities. 
you know, for technology and even in Beda and a num number of other places. But they have, they've neglected actually, uh, let's say, uh, education on the village level, you know. And there the people are still living the same sort of lives that lived before. 60% of the Chinese world is still uh, agrarian, still is very poor. So all that, I think it's, the Chinese have, you know, in some ways they've ignored all this by trying to be, just to modernize in a fast way, the whole idea of competing with the West. We have to compete with the West. And that's what Mao said, actually, when he launched the Great Leap Forward, was that they're going to catch up in steel production uh, with Britain in five years and with the United States in eight years. You know, that was the... And it's ridiculous. If you think about it, it's so kind of, you know, juvenile. It's so stupid. It's sort of counterproductive. And, you know... You know, whole thing with developing your national economy and national industry is not about a competition. Huh? So th this is the kind of mentality that they had, and they still have now. It's still come back now under Xi Jinping. Huh? It is competition with the United States. You know, instead of looking after your own sort of backyard and you know taking care of your own people, so you have a system where I think it's. I can't really predict exactly what might happen, but. What I am really hoping for, and this is what one or two even Chinese writers have been, uh, there's a writer called Liu Yao, who's a very, uh, uh, has come out a number of, uh, he's called the Solzhenitsyn of China. And uh, he has to live outside, he lives in Germany. And he came out with a statement that he really doesn't want to go back to China, but he's, he'll go back to Sichuan province if it becomes independent. That's his own province. So people are hoping in some ways they're looking at uh, an idea, the really sensible idea that China is not going to democratize something big like that. Can't it can't happen overnight? That maybe a better way would be had to have uh, smaller entities. Take away. Yeah, like uh, maybe not completely, maybe a kind of a, in a more European Union sense or whatever. Hopefully, and the thing is, these are enormous. I mean, uh, Sichuan province is the same size as uh, Spain, you know, <laughs> what have you. So these could completely s exist on their own. And I think that might be the way to go even for the China, a more sensible sort of way. Because in the, in the Chinese world, you do not see a single Democrat now at the moment. You know, Liu Xiaobo was the last person, you know. And even he was... To some extent, I think uh, he was noble, he was humane, but it was very naive in some ways to hope that the Communist Party would change because of some kind of uh, petition that they had, uh, you know, forward to the party. So no, I, I think a little bit. Sorry, please yeah. go on. No, no, no. Yes, uh, I'm talk a little that. bit about Xi Jinping, who you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was an assessment until recently that he was. After Mao, he had become the most powerful Chinese leader ever, right? Mm -hmm. But today, cracks are beginning to appear in that facade. And he's no longer considered, even if people, even by people who track the Chinese press, uh, you know, many of them say that incredible things are being written in the Chinese press that you never saw before. And mm -hmm. Xi Jinping's power uh, is really not as absolute as many people had thought it would be. Uh, and indeed, some people have gone to the extent of saying that perhaps there is a, a, a you know, considerable difference of opinion between generals in the People's Liberation Army and Xi Jinping. I wonder what you think. No, they had, they, I've, I've seen all that. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I think we have to relegate it to conjecture to some extent, you know, because I think... With a system like that, you know, even the alternate voices, unless it's clearly like we know who's saying it, uh, it's hard to, there's a lot of, um, let's say, hopeful voices coming out with these uh, sort of assessments, you know, that there might be alternative. I haven't really seen one at the moment, you know. So I'm crossing my fingers, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really going to make any predictions because... You know, the thing is, uh, on China, like, you know, I've written a lot, uh, mostly uh, posts in my own blog. But, you know, I wrote a kind of book on the, uh, on the Chinese economy, you know, on what, why the West in some ways. And this was a long time ago, 20 years ago. You know, Peter Novaro, the, you know, uh, President Trump's um, 
uh, an economic advisor. He wrote this book on China. So, you know, on the, on how Chinese uh, sort of economy really is uh, in some ways, uh, you know, everything's copied. They're stealing stuff and this and that and the other. Now, I had written 10 years before this guy. So I had friends in Washington. They said, they said you should sue him because he's copied your book. No, actually, he is more of an economist than I am. But I had also written all this earlier. But the thing is, you know, like, no matter how much you study their economy, this and that, they, it is very opaque. You know, so it's getting better now, this year especially. We are getting more information. But nonetheless, you know, I think we still have to wait a bit. A little bit about, therefore, about Tibet, Ramyang. Mm -hmm. You just envisaged a scenario where parts of China acquire greater autonomy, if not independence. Uh, and you mentioned one province. Is that your hope about Tibet also, at least in the near term? No, I think in Tibet, the, the there is a great sensitivity from China. I don't think they'll allow any kind of uh, autonomous, you know, stature. It's it because it's already had that reputation of fighting and uprising against uh, uh, the Communist Party far more than Xinjiang, you know. In Xinjiang, uh, the kind of resistance to the Communist Party was fairly recent, actually. It's a known, It's only in the last one decade. It's only after 9-11 that the Chinese began to get scared of Muslim insurrection in Xinjiang. You know, Earlier, a lot of the leadership in Xinjiang, you know, were co Communist Party people, you know, Uyghurs, were quite uh, cozy with the Communist Party, you know. But the Tibetan thing is where they really are, like, that's why the security in Tibet is tremendous. But I am really sort of hopeful on Tibet, primarily because of the kind of the repressive nature of uh, the Communist Party there. People like, and it's very strange, you know, because after, especially after the, let's say, the self immolations, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the sort of, let's say, the regional sort of administrations throughout these areas where this was happening, the Chinese, the Beijing government was cracking down on these people. They're saying you have to do something about this uh, self emulations. So what they did was some of the local governments began to provide some money to younger people to get involved in more like, let's say, um, cultural activities, uh, you know, even religious, just to distract them. And what's happened now, I've seen, there's a kind of a, on YouTube, sometimes you get um, uh, sort of, scraps of Chinese TV coming over. And there's a Tibetan TV from Eastern Tibet, Kamba TV. And there you get these people discussing Tibetan culture, like Tibetan epic songs, Tibetan literature, this and that. And these people never talk about uh, their, you know, like Kampa, you know, literature. They never talk about Amdo literature. You know, these are, you know, like they always talk about Tibetan. So, this is what reassures me about these people is that they are keeping that whole uh, memory of a greater Tibet, not just the Tibet Autonomous Region, but all these other areas. And these are being done uh, by Tibetans in a very sort of careful way. They don't want to say anything to annoy the party. So they always say, oh, yes, after Tibet was liberated by the PLA, yes, yes, and then so and so did this and that. But they're always, at the same time, they're letting the people know that when we talk about Tibet, it means the great, the Tibetan Empire. So they are reviving the whole Tibetan, you know, the memories of the Tibetan Empire in as many ways as they can. And this is what Gompo Tashi did also. Like, and that's the kind of, uh, I think, um, the political sort of genius of Gompo Tashi, you know, in Lhasa, was he, he couldn't start the resistance army right away. You know, nobody pay any attention to him. So he came across, you know, trying to revive the idea of the Tibetan Empire. Because at that time, that what the Tibetan government was only the government of the, it was called the Lhasa local government. Huh? So he used uh, the idea of the Tibetan Empire, of the three traditional regions of Tibet, to revive a kind of Tibetan nationalism. So I think uh, I see younger people inside Tibet doing that at the same time now. You know, So it gives me a lot of hope. I, I don't know exactly I can point, but I think there is... Uh, a movement in that direction, cultural at the moment, you know.
Take him to the end of this interview. I have one last question, uh, Jamyang. What does all of this mean for the Tibetan government in exile and Tibetans who live outside Tibet, you know, outside, uh, you know, Asia, uh, like yourself? Um, there is genuine, uh, you know, concern now that China is trying to establish its own Dalai Lama after His Holiness is gone. And, you know, they will try to influence that process. They will try to, you know, ensure that they take control of that process. And there's a lot of concern being, you know, expressed about this. His Holiness himself, in a sense, has addressed it uh, a couple of times. How do you see this pan out? You know, what is the, according to you, how do you see the situation post the time when His Holiness is there in physical form uh, pan out? You know, right at the moment inside, I think uh, the Tibetan uh, administration, you know, like they've given up even, they've given up on the idea of the Tibetan government in exile. This now the more like the Tibetan administration. And it was done basically to appease the Chinese. It was a hope that if we stop talking about Tibetan government in exile, that the Chinese might consider, reconsider talking to us. And that didn't happen. So the on the question of... Uh, what they could do, right, I think is on the question of the Dalai Lama's, um, let's say, next incarnation. I think that is vital. And the Chinese have addressed it actually much earlier, you know, I think 15 years ago. And I wrote an, uh, a long article rebutting their kind of point of view. But the whole idea is um, they've been fairly successful with the Panchen Lama, you know, with the kind of their own version of the Panchen Lama. And he's being trotted out now, and then he comes out and makes statements about his loyalty to Xi Jinping and how he observes Xi Jinping's thoughts and this and that. So they want a Dalai Lama to do it. And they've also done it for other Lamas. Now, this is not only one of Nearly all reincarnate Lamas, they have a department now set up for that. So with the Dalai Lama, they are hoping, and the Chinese take the long view on these things, you know. So, you know, they are hoping eventually that... Uh, they can string, string him along now and um, keep Dharamsala hoping something will happen. But after he dies, then they'll uh, come out of the new incarnate uh, in from Tibet, some cute kid, and then they'll call him the Dalai Lama. And then after a while, he'll grow up and he's going to talk and extol the virtues of, uh, you know, uh, of President Xi. Thought. <laughs> but <laughs> the thing is, His Holiness actually has a way out of this. And I said, it's, it is simple. It has been done before. It is traditional. It's not radical. That uh, he could choose his own incarnate, where he's yes. going to be born. You know, and uh, that sixth Dalai Lama did that. You know, he wrote, left a poem saying he's going to be born in Litan, you know. And you know, or the white cranes, you know, that, that poem. So this Dalai Lama could come out and say he's going to be born in Arunachal Pradesh, where the sixth yes. Dalai Lama was born, or in Ladakh. And he seems to enjoy going to Ladakh, and I'm sure the Ladakhi people will be thrilled to have him. So the thing is, he has the Himalayas to choose from. And the great thing is, if he chooses this, then Indian government gets dragged into, the, into this quagmire, whether they like it or not. And they have to take, you know, they cannot give up on that incarnate nation because, they, you know, all the population of their frontier states will yes. be the Alama followers. So, you know, they have to be... They have to take sides. And I think it will be good for the Tibetan world if they do that. And, you know, it is traditional. There's nothing uh, strange about this, you know. So this has happened before. So I think this is the way out for the Tibetans. And the, the Dalai Lama really ought to seriously think about this. Right at the moment, you know, and this is the thing, this is the approach that the Tibetan uh, administration seems to be taking, especially the people around the Dalai Lama who are trying to convince him. I think mm, there is this Lama who is this kind of a second in command in, in you know, not in the Tibetan administration, but up at the Dalai Lama's office. Uh, this person called Samdung Rinpoche, who's convinced basically that uh, the Tibetan church, the Gilupa church, you know, the uh, sect could become the next big uh, sort of, uh, mm, let's say, you know, intellectual, spiritual kind of power in China. 
they're thinking back to the days of the Sakya in the fifth Dalai Lama, the Sakyas also, you know, who influenced Kublai Khan. But, you know, they don't seem to realize that times have changed. Nothing of the kind is going to happen. But Samdhan Umpchi, actually, even he gave an um, interview to the New York Times, where he, in that was, I think, about seven or eight years ago, where he said uh, that uh, the issue of Tibetan political freedom is not important. What is really important is the spiritual welfare, well-being, and happiness of the Chinese people. And he said, we can be, we are the the guides to the Chinese achieving this. By we, he meant him and other monks, you know. So I think this is tremendously kind of, uh, let's say, ridiculous, you know, stupid to think in those terms. Yes, once upon a time in history, people could do that. But this was, you know, it was another time, another sort of set of beliefs, you know. It was a different world altogether. In this modern world, I don't think anything of the kind is going to happen. But nonetheless, his holiness has been. In, and this is not only with this Tibetan Lama, but there have been Western supporters of Tibet who've talked about this, that the Dalai Lama could be the next Pope of China or some, something ridiculous, you know. And this is the sort of stuff I have been sort of uh, wrestling with all all these years, writing rebuttals and stuff, nonsense like this. So in some ways, of course, it's uh, it's been totally frustrating, you know. Uh, my hair has gone gray. <laughs> And it, it, I've never achieved anything really very much except some readership, you know, on this. But this is the, the way it's going at the moment. His Holiness has come out and said he would love to go to Wutai Shan. And, uh, you know, this is the mountain in China, which is sacred to Manjushri, you know, the, the Bodhisattva. He'd love to go there and they're just hope, looking forward to it. But I don't think, you know, they string him along the Chinese. But the one thing is they'll never do. You know, and this I'm convinced. I could be wrong, but I think the percentage is very small. They will never ask him to come back to Tibet. It is a very, very dangerous thing to do. As it is, China, they cannot tolerate any little upheaval at the moment. You know, they, they really clamp down on anything. If the Dalai Lama comes, people will be, you know, they, they'll be just grabbing motors, anything, any kind of vehicle from Amdo, anywhere, all, you know, there'll be thousands and thousands of people like, you know, crazy. It's just like, they just go crazy. They just come where the Dalai Lama is. And it's going to create huge political tensions and you know, explosions even within Tibet. So some You're people... Right. I, mean, I, I heard a statement by uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama saying, you know, the Chinese state has tried their best to call me or you know, abuse me, call me all kinds of names. But look, after all these years, everybody in China knows who I am. People carry photos of me in their pockets, you know. Uh, surely they should wonder why this is true. Yeah. What you're explaining is exactly that. If if uh, the Dalai Lama goes to Tibet, there'll be tens and thousands, maybe millions of people who will pour yeah. out to greet him. Yeah, and then the thing is, if they try to send out security forces on this, Oh, no, there's going to be real violence there, you know. People are not going to put up with it. It's going to be really... And because you drag in religion, it makes things, you know, and multiply it by a factor of, you know, a thousand. What? So, yeah, it's going to be... Uh, whatever it is that, you know, I don't think His Holiness is going to get a chance to go back. But I really want the Tibetans, in some ways, not to rely only on the idea that the government of India might recognize Tibet as an independent country or the United States is going to do this and that. You know, that, that of course, is welcome if it happens, you know. But I think it's really important for Tibetans themselves to decide what their direction is by themselves, you know, what they really want. How much are they prepared to give up? How much are they prepared to invest in terms of... Uh, and this is like even in exile Tibetans. You know, in New York here, I have this uh, research center here. People talk about this all the time. But the, the real problem is when you have sort of weird ideas, you know, like the, that the Chinese might kind of uh, compromise with us. And, you know, at one point, and let me end with this, you know, just a couple of decades ago, no, let's say 15 years ago, 
the, the Dalai Lama's administration was hoping that Chinese would give them, uh, negotiate them on just one basis. But the Chinese had what they called one nation, two systems that they granted to Hong Kong and they gave. They, they said they would grant to Taiwan. And Tibetans were so excited by that. They said, if they just give us that, <laughs> now, we, we know what's happened to Hong Kong. Taiwan, you know, it's like, it's on the edge of, you know, a war. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that. You know. And it depends really could rethink everything, you know, in a sensible way and, you know, find new directions and a new way of uh, viewing their cause and their goal. No, you said this would be the last point, but I cannot let you go without asking you one question, which is, has intrigued me from the for, for a long time and especially as you and I began to talk today, Jamyang. You know, we began by talking about this entire thing about discomfort with Tibetan Buddhism because of its tantric roots and this yeah. idea that there was a purer, you know, almost like a white-robed Buddhism versus a, you know, orange-robed Buddhism, so to speak, without all the sort of yoginis and all the yeah. tantra and all of that, right? Um, many Westerners also prefer this white-robed Buddhism, so to speak. Yeah. Do you think, do you think, and of course, you know, that's the connection in a sense between Tibetan Buddhism and India, you know, this yeah. confluence of, you know, culture, of mythology and so on and so forth, right? Of, of, you know, of gods and goddesses and so on and so forth. Do you think that that is one of the reasons why the West, in a sense, preferred a sort of Chinese purified version of Buddhism compared to the original, compared to the real, which is mm -hmm. Tibetan Buddhism uh, and uh, with all its complexities. No, this is, uh, you know, in some ways, of course, people are learning. Now, Buddhist studies, especially in the West, uh, especially even on Tibetan Buddhism, people are, of course, nobody talks about Tibet, uh, what they call uh, Lamaism and stuff anymore. People really realize that you know, Vajrayana Buddhism, you know, my, yes. <laughs> it yes. was from India and the Tibetans took it from India. They took it from Nalanda University, you know, and the Tibetans are very faithful to it, you know. And of course, it did change when it got to Tibet, as religions always do, but never really substantially. Tibetans were very, very loyal to their kind of uh, Indian roots of their uh, belief systems, you know. But um, I think it's... Uh, you know, in India, sometimes they still haven't caught up with this. You know, this is where I really feel like uh, Tibetan, like the Dalai Lama should have, you know, with, he has some money. You know, he, he should have set up, endowed the chair on Tibetan studies in Calcutta University or in Delhi, you know, or on Buddhist, in Buddhist studies. Because even when uh, you have, um, you know, our kind of Bengali, um, you know, economist, you know, Nobel Prize winner. Yeah, Amartya Sen. You know, when he wanted to start Nalanda, he's talked about Nalanda, he's quite thrilled. You know, he wanted to exclude the Dalai Lama. You know, he wanted to do it with the Chinese, actually, you know. And and, and one thing is, again, he has the same idea that this whole Tibetan Buddhism is mumbo-jumbo and this and that. He doesn't realize that, you know, the whole Nalanda tradition, and His Holiness says it sometimes, but his English is unfortunately not very good, was observed in Tibet like near 100%, as much as people could, considering the difference in you know, environment and climate and everything. And Tibetans were very faithful to that. I know two uh, sort of great monasteries in Tibet where they even carried out you know, the Buddha's idea of not uh, staying in one place you know, all the time, moving you know, from place to place that the Buddha insisted on. There are monasteries, you know, in Tibet, there's uh, the uh, their kind of fascination with Buddhism is complete. The, you know, you think sometimes you look at a very poor Tibetan on the wayside, you know, rather than rags and, you know, with his uh, prayer wheels. And people don't realize actually, and when he pulls out a little, quite a, a lot of Tibetans are literate. You know, they're not literate in a fantastic way, but they can read their scriptures. And they appreciate, this is one of the things that Buddhism was never imposed on Tibetans. 
there has never been a kind of missionary uh, kind of effort from India. And Tibetans invited all the Indian gurus, you know, including from Bengal, we had, you know, like Atisha and all the, People invested a lot of money, even, collected gold. They went down to the Vikramashila to Nalanda. Mm. Please, sir, uh, you have to come. We will endow your college in this university with this much. And it, it, it was like, in, uh, it is something that, you know, I find lot, uh, with a lot of Tibetans, even now, they are really invested in their uh, spiritual world, you know, without making big hue and cry about it. You know, they are, and, and India is still so important to them. And I think this is why in India there should be a more kind of, I think, uh, exploration of their Buddhist past. Because that is, you know, when you look at India, you know, the great periods in, like, let's say, of Indian history is, you know, it's the Mauryan dynasty, is with Ashoka, is with the, all the Buddhist uh, sort of missionaries that went over all over Southeast Asia. You know, all you have, you know, in Thailand and Indonesia and stuff, this is what Indian culture did at that time, you know, and Tibet has a role in that, you know, and, and, and legitimate role. And I really feel um, in India, there's still, you know, Indians are just beginning the exploration of Tibet. And I hope my book, you know, in some ways will provide them, you know, one aspect of that history, the more modern, the kind of more, let's say, the political and, you know, the military history of what happened in the last few decades in Tibet. But this is my contribution to, you know, waking up India on this issue. <laughs> Let me normal. Echoes from Forgotten Mountains, Tibet in War and Peace, an absolutely brilliant book. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for joining me.